Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. Just as with all of my videos, I will include links down in the video description that allow you to jump from one section of the video to another. In addition, I will include links to the various topics that I discussed today, whether they are books, websites, patterns, yarns, you name it, it'll be down in the video description. This week, I have some knitting tidbits that have shown up in my feed and in my online interactions. I have some knitting history to talk about. I have a plan, a project plan to deal with my distractibility lately, as well as a new vintage project that I hope will help me deal with my hair while I wait another month before I can have a haircut. So let's get started. First of all, if you didn't see it. I did my very first live stream video this past Tuesday and it went well enough <laughs> that I think I will be doing it again. This was just to try it out and see if I could handle it. Um, you know, doing a live stream is very different from recording, editing, and then uploading. And part of the difference is in the equipment that I'm using and how I'm having to uh, edit on the fly and and kind of keep track of questions that people have. So when I woke up on Tuesday, I was feeling a little down about the state of things. And so in the afternoon, I took a walk outside. It was a beautiful day, unseasonably warm and sunny. Um, so I went for a walk through the woods near my house and felt much better. Then I returned a phone call. A friend of mine had called me the afternoon before while I was down in the basement sewing up masks for me and my husband. And I didn't notice that she had called until later in the evening. So I returned the call to her and I had a really nice chat with her. Um, she's the president of the Weavers Guild. So we have a, a lot of textile related things that we could talk about and um, making plans for a, a virtual knitting groups and things like that. And then I did the live stream. So I was a little nervous about that, um, but I, but at, after an initial bumpy start getting it to go live, it went really well. And I really enjoyed interacting with knitters and answering questions. And uh, I just found that at the end of the day, when I was going to bed, um, I was happy and uh, my body felt better too. I, I have found that I've been kind of tense and aching lately. And even if I go out for a walk, um, I don't always feel that that great at the end of the day. But Tuesday, I felt great. So I know I want to repeat that experience. I don't know uh, what that's going to mean. I did do the live stream on Tuesday, which is, is normally a day I would do a technique Tuesday if I was going to do a technique video. Uh, so I think in the future, I will probably do it on a different day of the week. I just don't know what perhaps Sunday. Uh, and I and I doubt that I would ever do three videos in one week. Uh, it would probably be either a live stream or a Technique Tuesday. Um, and I will certainly continue to do Casual Fridays every week. Normally, the only reason I would not do a Casual Friday would be because I was traveling and I'm not doing that right now. So it might be some kind of mixture of live streams, maybe on a Sunday, um, and then maybe a, sometimes a Technique Tuesday. We'll just have to play it by ear and see how it goes and, and see how you guys enjoy doing it. I, I really had a great time on Tuesday. So if you didn't, if you missed the live stream, you can still see it. It is saved on my YouTube channel. You can see the chat that occurred uh, during the, the video as well. So one of the things that I, I was reminded of this week when I was uh, talking uh, with a friend on Facebook uh, was that the, the UK has a knitting and crochet guild and they have these archives uh, of a huge number of books and knitting pamphlets and also actual physical objects in their possession. And somebody had mentioned this months ago in, in the comments, the, the Knitting and Crochet Guild, and I had looked at it um, briefly and and did but didn't didn't join or anything, but I, I joined it this past weekend. Obviously, I can't go to meetings, I can't go to any of their events, but what it does give me is access to their online archives of uh, knitting pamphlets. And 
So that is really interesting, but there are a lot of things on their website that you can look at even if you aren't a member. And one of those that I find really interesting is something called 100 Objects. What it is, is uh, things that are within their ar archives, physical items, and they will have a little blurb about that particular item and, and talk about um, its importance, basically, in knitting and crochet history. And they're up to like item 80. I don't know if they're posting a new one every day. I'm not sure. Last weekend they were in the 70s. They had object number 76 showing. And you can look back at all the previous objects going back to object number one. Um, and today when I took a look, at, they were in, into the 80s. And they must be posting a new one each day. I'm really not completely sure. But I will leave a link down there. It's really interesting to see. One of the things I was wondering about was whether they had um, these books by Jane Coster and um, Margaret Murray that I bought that were published in the 1940s. And one of the objects that they have in the 100 objects, it might be like number seven, is the very first book in this series. Uh, they don't seem to have them digitized and that, that would be because the items would still be under copyright and they would, they would need permission of the copyright holders. But they do own the physical um, book, at least the first one, if not the entire series. But it's really interesting to see all of the different items they have. They're from all different time periods, all different types of things. Some things are tools, some are patterns, some are uh, knitted or crocheted items, a variety of things. So it's really interesting. One of the other things that showed up in my feed, it was, I think it was in my Twitter feed that Clara Parks retweeted. It was a story that was on CNN.com uh, about a finding that uh, the oldest yarn, basically, that, is, that has been found um, is 52,000 years old. Now, I, I put a link to the CNN article, which is really aimed at just sort of the, uh, the basic uh, person, um, but they discuss where that information came from. It was originally published in Nature, and there is a link. So I'm putting a link to the more academic article as well that gives a lot more detail. So previously, the previous uh, oldest known piece of of a cord or or yarn or something like that was only 19,000 years old. So this is significantly older. And the thing about about um, antiquities is that the things that survive are things like that are made from metal or um, stone or, or things like that. And you don't tend to see things that were part of domestic life, like clothing, you know, items like that. So this is a really significant find. So the way that this yarn was created was by stripping the bark off of a specific type of tree and getting the fibers that were underneath the bark. And those fibers would only be available at a certain time of year. So it's clear that they had to know that those fibers were available then. And then they had to be able to figure out, you know, how to twist them together. And they didn't just twist them together, it, they plied to them. So it's a three ply cord and made from this, uh, the fibers from this tree. And it was, looks like it was probably used to like hold a handle onto some kind of stone implement. So it was used as a way of tying it onto and to create a tool with a handle like that. So it's, it was really fascinating to me. And like I said, I have the links down in the description. One other thing that came up in my feed was that there is a documentary from 2017 that is on BBC's website. And I don't know if there's a difference between BBC One and BBC Two in terms of their website. Uh, and the video is available, the, it's a documentary, one hour documentary. It's available to watch on their website until I think April 21st. But if you live outside of the UK, you can't access it. So I looked up the title of that documentary and I was able to find it on YouTube. The documentary is called The Town That Thread Built. And it's about the thread industry in Paisley, Scotland. And at one point, it was J.P. Uh, Coates and Cl I think it's Coates and Clark. It's the the two families that each started competing thread companies. They were both in Paisley, and then in the 1890s they merged together. So it's I think it's now called the J.P. Coates company, but maybe it was J.P. Clark and Ann Coates. I'm not sure. There's the Coates family and the Clark family. But anyway, the two, the two families joined their companies together in the 1890s. 
And at one time, they were the third largest corporation in the world, second only to U.S. Steel and Standard Oil. They had factories all over the world, and it was a system where uh, kids who left school at 13 or 15 would go to work uh, at the mill and the really smart kids could work their way up and they would end up, a lot of them ended up traveling to different countries to set up factories in different places. And it really created a, a really um, amazing town until eventually things fall apart and it's uh, Paisley is no longer the same as it was and that they don't produce, there's no mill in Paisley anymore. The mills that the company still owns are in, in other countries. But it's a fascinating documentary I have to admit that as good as I am at understanding various accents from all over the UK and Ireland, I was struggling with the Paisley accent. <laughs> it's a Western Scottish accent, and I don't know if it's just a harder accent for, uh, for to understand for people who outside of Scotland, or if it's because I've been watching this show called Shetland. I watched it a couple of years ago and then they've got new seasons. So I watched the whole thing again. And those are accents from the Eastern part of Scotland. <laughs> and those I find very easy to understand. Plus they're actors rather than just working class people from the West of Scotland. I, I was struggling, but I, and sometimes they have to repeat and that's really unusual for me. It might be a little tricky <laughs> for some of you if you're not used to, to that accent, but it's really worth watching. It was fascinating. So I've mentioned a couple of times before that I follow this woman on Twitter who is a fashion historian and her name's uh, Kate Strasden. And of course, she follows other fashion historians, textile historians, and they follow her. And so she's often retweeting them. And one of the tweets, uh, one of the things that she retweeted this past, I think it was last weekend, was a woman who's a lecturer at the University of Glasgow. She's a lecturer in dress and textile histories at the University of Glasgow. You know, she's at home like everybody. And she said, and she tweeted something about, she's tried learning to knit many times and has always failed. And maybe, maybe this time is the, is the time that it will work. And so I saw, and she was asking for tips for novice knitters, tip, you know, what's your top tip? Uh, for a novice knitter. And so I don't even know what I, I told her, but um, I, I was really interested in that and I was and, and at her progress and to see what she was doing. By the end of the weekend, she had produced a very nice piece of garter stitch. So I was like, good for her. When she was getting ready to start knitting, she posted a photograph that showed the two little booklets, the learn to knit booklets she had and her and her knitting needles and her yarn. And then there's like a glass of wine and a cut crystal glass that I thought was really pretty. And when she then later uh, showed the little piece of knitting that she had done, I looked back at her original photo and I noticed that the, the label on the yarn she was using said U of Glasgow. And I said, what? They have their own yarn? So I immediately went and Googled. And sure enough, the University of Glasgow has their own yarn. They have four different colors. They have like a natural color, like a cobalt blue, a kind of a dusty pink color, medium Victorian pink color, and then a, a gray. So they have four different colors that they sell in their shop. They're where you could buy various university souvenirs and things. And so I was looking at it and I was like, what is this, you know, what kind of yarn is this? And it's, they have a farm, the university has a farm and I don't know exactly what they use that farm for. The name of the farm is either Kachno or Kachno. I don't know how you'd pronounce it, but it's C-O-C-H-N-O is the name of the farm. And so they have sheep growing on there. And there are two of the women, two of the professors there who are like uh, historians in materials and textiles. Uh, they, it was their idea to, um, to create their own yarn. So they had these sheep and they share them. So I was looking up, well, what is the name of the breed? And so the breed is called a Scotch mule. And I thought, wait a second. <laughs> to me, 
a mule is a female horse crossed with a male donkey and then he produces an animal called a mule. And so I was like, well, I wonder what that means. And so I went and looked at a description of what they are and what it is. It's a Scottish black faced ewe crossed with a blue faced Leicester ram and that creates this Scotch mule. So it's a cross breed. And I just thought it was interesting that they were using the term mule because there's a lot of sheep breeds that are crosses with other things. So, but then it got me thinking about the term mule and that the Aran sweater that I'm knitting right now, the yarn is this Zwart Bless yarn that I bought from a sheep farmer in Kilkenny, Ireland. And it's milled at a woolen mill there in Kilkenny using a, a spinning mule. And so I started thinking about this, that this term mule has, is used, I wonder how often it gets used in, textile terminology or just UK terminology, if that's a really common uh, word to use when you are combining something. Um, because I remembered that the spinning mule was, was some sort of a combination of two other technologies. And so I went back again, as I looked this up, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago, and some of it sunk in. And I have one of these things where I have to go back and, and look it up again so I can deepen my understanding. Um, and so that as the more I learn about various things of spinning, when I go back and reread something, then, then it makes more sense to me and I can connect it into something else I've known. The Industrial Revolution started because of textiles. I had used, I used to think, oh, well, it was had to do with steam engines and steel and cars and or boats or things like that. Uh, and manufacturing, and it did have to do obviously with manufacturing, but it started with the textile industry. And the very, the one of the very first innovations was something that was called a flying shuttle that weavers used. And so when you had a really wide loom, it would take two weavers, one at each end, so they could shove the, the shuttle that had the yarn that was creating the weft that goes sideways and when you're weaving. So they have one at each end and they would shove it. Well, it would take four spinners to create enough yarn for those weavers uh, to weave. So you had, you had four spinners for one loom and each loom was operated by two weavers. Well, somebody in like 1730, somewhere around that, in the, in the 1700s, in the 1730s, um, somebody invented this flying shuttle and it was a way to, um, for the weaver to sit, one a single weaver to sit at a at a loom and operate this shuttle that would they had this string and cable system and they could uh, they could use it and they could fling that shuttle all the way. So then it only took one weaver to handle a loom. And within you know 10, 15 years, these were widely used these flying shuttles. Well, that meant you needed eight spinners to supply the wool for this loom and this weaver. And so that really was, it was creating a bigger and bigger gap between the labor that could produce the yarn and the labor that could produce the woven fabric. So the flying shuttle was invented by this man named John Kay, and that was in like 1733. So then James Hargreaves in 1764-ish, he invented what was called the spinning jenny. And that was a device that could have eight different spools and that could be managed by one spinner, could, could uh, spin eight different spools of yarn at one time. So that could increase the output. The problem was that the yarn wasn't very strong. So then the next invention was something called a water frame. And that one was invented by Richard Arkwright and another man named John Kay that's not the same one that invented um, the flying shuttle. It's a different John Kay. But those two invented this water frame um, that made um, spinning easier or better in some way. And then along comes Samuel Crompton in 1775-ish, and he combines the water frame and the spinning jenny together to create the spinning mule. And so that's why that was called the spinning mule because it was a combination of these two other things. And he, he did some fundamental changes to how things were being spun, but it could create a much stronger 
uh, yarn than the spinning jenning could and I think and then could also be expanded to have many 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 uh, spindles running at one time. So that to me is really interesting this idea of a mule uh, for spinning and then also this mule that's term that's being used for these sheep. So I did order some yarn from the University of Glasgow. Of course their shop is closed and uh, so it'll probably be a while before they can ship it out. I got an email from them today that said, you know, <laughs> as you know, we're not open, so it's gonna be a while. Uh, and we can refund you if you want. I'm like, no, I'll just, I'm not in a hurry. I just want that yarn. I wanna, I wanna see what this yarn is like. It's just the whole idea that this university has this sheep farm and then they're producing yarn. We have, the University of Minnesota is an agriculture, started out as an agricultural college. It's what was called a land grant college. They were established by Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s. And so in these states that were getting settled further and further west, it was a way to create these places where farmers could go and learn the latest techniques. They were, became universities and they did engineering as well, not just uh, farming practices, but also engineering. And, and then you got home economics for the women. And so it was a different sort of university education than had, had previously uh, been done. Um, but I, and I know we have a lot of, like we have a lot of crop farming on our university fields. But I wonder, and I'm sure they must be doing stuff with sheep, but I, I, I bet you anything that they don't spin their own yarn. And I'm wondering, that would be a kind of an interesting thing to find out if, if, they, if they do that. And I'd be curious if any other uh, farms, uh, university farms around the world ha has something similar that they do, because I'd love to get my hands on um, yarn like that. So after spending several years working really hard and getting rid of all my UFOs, I managed to do it um, this year in February. And the problem with that was that the sweater project I was working on, which is this Roaring Twenties vintage sweater project, I got to the point where I'd been working only on that for long enough that I was kind of getting sick of it. And then I ran into um, the, the part where it was mostly crochet and it turns out I will do crochet, but I don't love it, and I, and I need to be able to knit. <laughs> so, and I was feeling very distracted um, with everything that's going on. And so I decided I needed, I needed more projects. So a couple of weeks ago, I asked you guys for feedback on four sweater projects that I had planned and just what your thoughts were on that. Um, and you wanted me to do this uh, traditional Danish sweater, which I wanted to do too, but it turned out I didn't, the yarn that I had in my stash wasn't going to work with it. And I needed fingering weight yarn instead. Uh, I didn't know what fingering weight yarn I was going to use or what I would want to order. And miraculously, a package uh, of yarn that I had ordered for another purpose that was worsted weight, I had spontaneously decided to buy a, a few balls of fingering weight of the same yarn, which is a brown sheep nature spun, because I was curious about how that fingering weight yarn would work. And I, because it was spontaneous, I totally forgotten about it. So it turned out I had, did have, we had some fingering weight yarn that would be appropriate for a Danish sweater, enough to swatch with, but not to knit the sweater with. So, uh, so I decided to work on this Aran sweater that was sort of barely in progress that I had designed a year and a half ago. Um, so two of the other projects, one was a cabled sweater that would have intarsia cable with some hand dyed yarn that I had done. And that one is just a, an idea. So that's not, that is not ready to go. Uh, and the fourth one was a 1940s a vintage sweater because that would be the next vintage sweater in my long-term project to knit my way through the 20th century one decade at a time but I've only been knitting vintage sweaters for the past year so I kind of didn't want to do that either so uh, so that was kind of what I planned well I work on the Aaron sweater and I'll work on a sock. And so I started a sock project and that seemed like maybe that was going to be enough. And then I realized, no, I really need to have a bigger plan. So it used to be a couple of years ago when I had, when I realized I had 40 or more than that UFOs uh, and I d devoted the whole year or most of the year to finishing as many as I could. 
One of the things that I did was, of course, create a spreadsheet to organize all of them, to list them all kind of by category and figure out what needed to be done on them and how long that would take. And then I would treat them, each, each of those chunks uh, within a project as a sub-project. So I might knit a square of a blanket and then I would knit a sock and then I would knit a sleeve. Or, so I'd rotate around like that. And so that's the kind of thing I felt like I needed. I need to be able to just kind of move from one thing to another because my my tension is not that focused right now. One of the things I did was line up more sock projects. So as soon as I'm done with Sam's sock, then I'll start working on Nina's socks. And when Nina's socks are done, I'll start working on my brother's socks. So I have sock projects uh, planned and lined up and yarn picked out for that. So I can just go from one to the other. The sweater projects I've got, you know, I've got that vintage sweater project. I needed to do some crochet things. And I thought there's no way at this point in that project, I'm just going to sit down and power through it. it may, it, maybe it will happen, but I'm not going to power through to the end. So I need to look at what are the different things um, that need to be done. And one of the things that has to be done is <clears throat> I have to knit six little crochet squares that are all in the kind of beige color. For me, that was like, oh, that's something I could do as like a little break. Well, I, you know, oh, my hands are tired from knitting cables all day. I think I'll crochet a little square. So I just want to have this kind of plan. But I also wanted something besides those two sweaters, the Aaron sweater and the Roaring Twenties one, and something besides the socks. Because one, of, you know, I just really like things also that are new and different that can engage me and keep me excited for a couple of days. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to do that, that I did recently was I did a hat knit with Shetland wool yarn. It was last year's free pattern for Shetland wool week called Roadside Beanie. And I really enjoyed doing that. And, and then two weeks ago today, the new Shetland Wool Week 2020 pattern was released. A free pattern, I talked about it a bit last week. And I really liked one of the colorways and I was struggling to find somebody that could sell it, um, that, was, that, that had it in stock that I could buy it from. Because living in the United States, I can't buy directly from Jameson's of Shetland because they have a North American distributor. So uh, I can order from Jameson and Smith, directly but not Jameson's of Shetland. So I had to find some place in, in the country um, that could I could um, buy the yarn from and I was struggling to find it. So I knew that that was one of the patterns that I would want to do, one of the projects I would want to do. So I did find somebody was selling a kit of the colorway that I wanted. They're in Canada. The problem was the kit that colorway is very popular and they were sold out and so they said is there a different colorway or is there uh, different colors do you want to choose different colors or do you want us to to suggest other colors and I said please suggest other colors because I can't choose them I'm mildly colorblind and I just wouldn't be able to do that so they're going to send me a kit but again it's from Canada and sometimes things get stuck at the border so I don't know how long uh, that's going to be. So what I decided was, I was, it was two things. One is I'm going to start working on the traditional Danish sweater and by doing some swatching. So this will add a third sweater into the mix and be at very, they're all three at different stages. And all of them are going to require some thinking and figuring out at different points, some design decisions. Um, but they're just, they're at very different points in the project and they have different levels of enthusiasm for each one. And they have very different types of yarn and very different types of stitch patterns. So that makes it really nice for me. So I, I had ordered some a, a brown sheep nature spun yarn and a worsted weight yarn, a worsted weight, which is what I use for my uh, swatches when I do technique videos. And I was low on that a few weeks ago. So I ordered some and I, and spontaneously I ordered some nature spun in the fingering weight because I was curious about how it would compare to the Shetland wool like I had used to knit this uh, roadside beanie. And so I'd forgotten I ordered it. it, it appeared. And so I have yarn to, to swatch with. I, I, I won't be knitting a sweater in this color probably, um, but it's just a, a pretty color and it's, it's one that's light enough that I can do swatching for. I've got this idea like, okay, now I can, I can work on this as long as it's interesting to me, but if I get restless, then I can turn to this. And then if I get restless, then I can turn to this. And and I've got enough other things going on that I can schedule myself in 
to work on my uh, 1920s sweater to make sure that I'm making progress on it without feeling like, oh, not this again. So that's just kind of how I'm, I'm juggling things around. So far, I've done, uh, I did a gauge swatch right here. And you can see I've got a little line through the middle. Normally, I can predict pretty easily what needle I am going to use, need to use in order to get a particular gauge. But when I'm working with the thinner yarns, the fingering weight yarns, uh, it's less I, uh, reliable for me because most of the time that I'm knitting with fingering weight yarns, I'm knitting socks. And when I'm knitting socks, I'm not knitting them to the recommended gauge. So the ball band might say, knit this at seven and a half stitches per inch. And that is the gauge that would be appropriate for a stockinette sweater. But I'm knitting like at nine stitches an inch uh, on smaller needles to get a firmer gauge to make a, a sock that resists stretching out and will hold up over time so that it will be harder wearing. And when you are using smaller needles and working at firmer gauges for a yarn, you're cramming stitches in tighter. And so for me, I can't always re reliably guess what gauge I'm going to get with a particular needle. The way I can um, when I'm knitting at a more, at the more recommended gauge or at a looser gauge, I am very confident at what needle size I will need. But because I'm mostly knitting with fingering weight yarns at these firm gauges, I don't always have a sense of, well, if I was knitting a fingering weight yarn at the recommended gauge, what needle would I need? No, I'm just not always sure. I was guessing what I would need because I was knitting socks recently at seven and a half stitches per inch and I was using a US one and a half, which is a 2.5 millimeter needle. I thought, well, if I'm getting seven and a half stitches per inch on a two and a half millimeter or one and a half, maybe a 2.75 millimeter needle, which is a US two, maybe that would give me seven stitches per inch. So that's what I did here on the bottom. Uh, but I actually got seven and a half stitches per inch. So I got the same gauge. <laughs> on um, the size two needle that I got with a one and a half, but this is actually a thinner yarn than the yarn I was knitting at the tighter gauge. So, you know, I was, I was knitting firmer with a thicker yarn and that's, that's where the trouble came in. So, and this was just still on the needles. The thing I'm expecting about this yarn is that it's going to bloom. And I don't know if that's also going to change the size of the stitches. I don't know if it's gonna change the fabric. So it's possible that when this is washed, that it will actually change gauge. I don't know yet. This was a US 2, a 2.75 millimeter needle. So then I switched to a US 3, which is a 3.25 millimeter needle. And then I got seven stitches per inch. So I have not washed this yet. I steamed it so that I could hold it up and show you, but this is not the way this fabric is going to be once it's been washed. And so I you know, measured the gauge before and then I'm gonna measure the gauge after I wash, um, wash this and then see what needle size I wanna use. So when I swatch, like I'm looking to get information and I swatch for different reasons and I want different information. So one of the pieces of information I wanted was would I like this yarn uh, as a sweater? So I'm doing things like Will I be able to, to uh, wear it next to my skin? If I'm wearing knitting something at a fingering weight yarn, I'm not gonna be wearing a thicker t-shirt under it like I do with these heavier sweaters. Um, and so my arms are probably gonna be right, you know, touching this and how's that going to feel? So that's one of the pieces of information I'm looking for. The other is the gauge and what needle size I need to get that gauge and what happens to the yarn after it's been washed. That's the kind of information I'm looking for with this swatch. I also do swatches to get other kinds of information. And one of the pieces of information I wanted to know was, um, what, was what would it be like to knit this stitch pattern. So this is a, a star uh, stitch pattern from the, the traditional Danish sweaters book. That, so that this is the book I'm talking about. So they have, um, you know, 28, 30 different types of stars, these eight pointed stars, they are all different kinds. They have all different kinds of other texture stitch patterns that are combined to create these sweaters. So this was my favorite star. 
And so I wanted to see what it was like to knit because it has some very different um, things about it that I hadn't done before. So one of the purposes is do I like knitting this stitch pattern? Like if I'm going to do a bunch of these, how will I feel about doing a bunch of them in the course of knitting the sweater? Uh, another one is where am I likely to make mistakes? What's, where am I going to get tripped up? Um, I do this with lace patterns a lot. I know that there's going to be some place in a, in a lace pattern where I forget to do yarn overs frequently. And so if I can do a swatch on a smaller number of repeats, I can quickly see where I'm likely to make those mistakes. And I'm building muscle memory for working the stitch pattern and I'm, I'm building the ability to be able to look at and focus on the fabric rather than on the chart. Once I get used to what's actually happening, I, I don't have to refer to the chart as much and I can pay more attention to what's on my needles and I can more likely to catch mistakes that way. So there are a lot of reasons uh, why I wanna do that. Sometimes there's an interesting stitch pattern that I find is super tedious. And I'm like, there's no way I wanna knit with this. So that's the kind of information I'm looking for uh, with this. Uh, I also wanted to practice some techniques that, that are in this particular uh, star. One of them is um, there is a, a she calls them horizontal stitches uh, going. The, so these stitches are going sideways. This is the same technique that's used in a lateral braids uh, in various Baltic uh, traditional knitting. I think Estonian knitting probably has this, and I know Latvian does. One of those traditions calls them vickel braids. Um, but the difference is though that in a vickel braid you typically would be going from edge to edge or you'd be working in the round and do the entire round and then connect that braid where this is starting and finishing in the middle. So there's a couple of different techniques uh, for that. And the other thing is that there are these uh, diagonal um, lines right here that are created using what a lot of people would call right and left twists. So it's, it's a, like a two stitch cable with one stitch crossing the other. In this case, one of the stitches, the one that crosses under is a purl, and the one that crosses over is a knit. Now I've done these kinds of things many times in Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns, but in those patterns, the knits are always twisted, and these they are not. And she, Vivian Hoxbro, has, she explains in the book, um, how to do these twists and you have to do them every row so you're doing a, if you're doing knitting flat you have to do them the right side row and the wrong side row and she has three different methods uh, that you can choose from for each one she has Vivian's method she has the way that she does them and it's I've never seen seen these done this way before and it's frankly ingenious um, secondly she's got a way of working them uh, where you keep the two stitches on the needle and you work the second stitch on the needle, keep it on there, and then you work the first stitch. She has ways of, of doing that. And then the third way is to use a cable needle. Her method is to slip the stitches from one needle to another. And you do it in one of two ways, depending on if you're going left or if you're going right. In one method, you're slipping them one at a time as if to knit like you would with an SSK. Um, and the other method, you're slipping the two of them together like you were doing a knit two together. Uh, so there's you know two different ways of slipping them and then there's two different ways of returning them. One of the, one of the methods is to return them, just pass them back over. And the other one has you bringing your left needle from right to left through them to return them. It's, and you know, it's just, a, it's a really unusual thing. And it was a lot to keep track of, like two of these, these different techniques, doing them on the right side of the work and the wrong side of the work and keeping track of a knit pearl pattern, a pattern that's basically half knits, half pearls. And so when you're working on the back side versus the right side and trying to keep in mind, wait, am I on the right or the wrong side? And should it be knitting? Should it be purling? you know, what should I be doing? So there was a lot of, there was a fair amount of, of orienting myself that I needed to do. Um, so that was really a, a valuable process for me. So just to refresh your memory is the, this is the, uh, this is the, the vintage uh, 1920s sweater uh, that I've been working on. And 
I'm working on the little squares for the collar and then I'm going to have to do the cuffs and then I'm going to have to sew up the sides and the underarm is going to be tight so I want to put some kind of little gusset under there to make that fit. So that's what's left to do on this. So uh, let's see the Aran sweater I, I've gotten up uh, past the armholes I'm heading up toward the, the shoulders. Now the thing with this yarn it's really dark. And so a lot of times I have to get my lamp right over the top of it. And it's kind of a, a rougher yarn. It gets much softer when it's washed. When I, I had knit one skein of it a year ago, and then I washed it to see what happened. And it had softened and bloomed a little bit. So it is softer, but it's still a rustic yarn. But as I'm knitting with it, it can kind of uh, hurt my, my hands. So that's another reason I want to be able to switch to something else. Uh, and then the other thing that's actually in progress is a pair of socks. So I've got one sock knit and I have to knit the second sock. These are for my daughter's uh, boyfriend. So I still wanted one more kind of quick-ish project to work on that wasn't socks and that is something that I could do now instead of having to wait until I received uh, the yarn from this Canadian uh, yarn shop. I've been worried about my hair. <laughs> A lot of people have been worried about this. I wasn't worried several weeks ago because you know I got my hair cut five weeks ago and yesterday was when I had my appointment scheduled to get my hair cut, which of course all of the salons are closed, so I couldn't do that. They're going to keep everything shut down through the end of April and not opening again till May 4th. So my salon had called me and said my hair, I'm not getting my hair cut till May 7th. So I have four more weeks, three and a half, four weeks, four weeks to go before I can get my hair cut. And my hair cuts, my hair is very short. I don't have ways of, I don't do anything with my hair. It's not like, oh, I can just put it in a ponytail. I don't have enough hair for that. So I've been thinking about what am I gonna do? I'm making, if I was just at home, it wouldn't matter, but I'm making videos every week and how am I gonna handle that? And do I care if I look ridiculous? Or, you know, what am I gonna do? And I thought maybe it would be fun to do a hat project from one of my vintage books. And I, I showed you guys um, last, is this one Knitting Illustrated, Practical Knitting? I showed you guys uh, a project uh, last week that I, when I was flipping through this. So this book, this is uh, Knitting for All, published in 1941. It's the second book in an eight book series by Jane Coster and Margaret Murray. You know, my next vintage sweater will be a 1940s sweater, but that's probably gonna be a while. It's gonna be later this year. Uh, and I've got all these 1940s books and I thought, well, it would be fun to knit a small project from here now and so I thought it would be fun to do um, it's called a three-cornered hat and then it's subtitled it's foolish but it's fun and what's interesting about this book is that they have for every pattern that they have in this particular book it's not true for all of the other ones the, every book is in the series is unique in some way they show they here's the pattern for for the item and then here's how all the different ways that you could wear it or that you could alter it to you know with sleeves without sleeves you could do this you could do that and so this is the little hat it looks kind of like a little cat <laughs> little cat ears and it's in a solid color on this page but it has different ways of wearing it one of the ways is to knit it in stripes and so they they tell you that, uh, three colors and they tell you how many um, ridges of garter stitch to do in each color and, and so they mix up the number of ridges and the order in which you're working the stripes. So so here it is uh, right um, right away oh, anyway, here. So here it is there. It's basically like it was worn in the other page but then here she has it turned around so that she's got the the point that would have been in the back is in the front and then she's kind of flattened the ears and then they say you can even do this thing where you kind of fold those flattened things in this way. Uh, they have some kind of name for that hat. They call it a forage cap effect. And so it, it is, it looks like a very foolish but fun hat. And so I thought it would be, it might be fun um, <laughs> to try one of these hats out. I don't know that I can um, wear it for the entire podcast, 
but it's something to try and and it would be fun so I have two choices and you guys can tell me what you think I can do it in a solid color and I have this beautiful yarn it's LGF series yarn I this is from my friend Margaret she has a she has a yarn dyeing business uh, about an hour west of the Twin Cities. I went out there last fall and I interviewed her and, and went to her dye house, which is really cool. I'll, I'll leave a link to that video up here. It's really cool. So she gave me this a skein of yarn uh, when I was there and it's beautiful. And it's meant to be knit into socks, uh, but I thought it could be fun as a hat. Um, I think it looks okay. I mean, I think the color is okay for me. Um, the other choice, the other choice is to do stripes. Now in the book, it's black and white photos, but they're saying, well, the original colors were maroon, lime green, and gray. And I was, and you can't tell. It took me a while to figure out which one was which. I think in the book that the lightest color was a gray, and then the one just slightly darker was lime green and then the darkest was maroon. Well, I don't have quite those colors, but I do have, um, this isn't really a maroon, but it's kind of a dark red and I've got this kind of chartreuse green and I've got a darker gray. <laughs> so I could do the hat with the stripes just to see what it looks like um, because it's gonna be a silly hat anyway. So I'm kind of inclined to do the stripes, uh, but I could do that beautiful yarn that um, Margaret gave me last fall as well. So let me tell me what you think if I should do it in a solid color or the stripes. Clearly I'm not going to be wearing this uh, on a daily basis uh, next winter. It's not really a hat meant to keep your head warm which is what I need in Minnesota. It's it's a it's a, an accessory hat. So I was kind of surprised that there aren't that many hat patterns. Well, kind of surprised and not surprised in these books. I did look through all of them. They have a few crocheted caps that I'm not going to do. They have one other hat that's a fez. And you can change it up by knitting this uh, little scarf thing and arranging it into a turban style and smushing the head. They have like different ways you can wear it. But the... The scarf is knit with a two-ply yarn, which is a lace weight yarn, and then you're supposed to double up a three-ply yarn to make a six-ply yarn to knit the hat. And that, I just, there's no way I can do that. I could knit the fez, but I wouldn't be able to knit, I, I wouldn't be able to have the same color to do the scarf thing. So um, we'll see how desperate I get as we get toward the end of April. Uh, but let me know what, what you think about that. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.